sovereign work of God in a broken man's life, and he gives them another opportunity for another life. It's a wonderful picture, and it's understated, but wonderful little moments there uh, that are powerful. Well, the point is, your whole life actually has tender mercies, that God gives you these mercies and this grace and this goodness that he lavishes upon us, but we, he whispers in those mercies and we don't hear them. Then he might have to speak to us in our conscience, but the problem there is we can sear our conscience by not listening to it. And the more you go against what you know you should do, then the less you're going to be able to hear that voice the next time around. And so you can dull your conscience and you can, after a while, rationalize foolish behavior in such a way that you can, you got a pang, but you over, overlook it. And after a while, you don't even notice the pang anymore. And that's kind of a frightening thought. So then, then if that's not going to work, what must God do? He's got to shout. And that's where the pain comes in. Now, I'm not to say, therefore, that, oh, let me see then. Bo is saying that if you are always listening to his whispers and your pleasure, you'll never have any pain. Don't make that your conclusion. I'm not saying that. That would be too simplistic. But I think all, all things being equal, you'd be a whole lot better off if you listened uh, to his whispers and maintained a context of profound gratitude. After all, the fervency of prayer is greatest when the need is most urgent, as I've said. And it's in times of affliction, then, as I see it, that uh, we experience the heights of reality. Often, in the length of time we spend talking to God and the earnestness with which we talk, your prayer somehow how it takes on another dimension when you're going through those hardships. Uh, and when typically then you cry out and ask others to help you in that prayer to bear the load with you. It's called intercession. And so we, uh, we reach out to others to help us with that. That's what we do in this group. We intercede for one another. We look out for one another. We pray for one another. And we seek to serve one another. And that's really what the body is meant to be. So when the need is, the, is sharply vivid, then one begins to search their uh, poor use of time and becomes more conscious of really, I need to uh, be forgiven for my lack of praise to God, my uh, failure to be thankful, uh, my uh, loss of adoration and praise. I think it's a very good thing for us to uh, develop and cultivate that. And uh, we wrestle with these things all the time. So if God would not have us till we came to him from the purest and best of motives then who would be saved? He knows us well, and he knows that no one comes to him out of the best motives. Uh, so if restlessness does the trick, so be it. That um, even if goodness uh, lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Whatever it takes, he'll stoop to conquer. But his desire, his desire, as though it may be these things that get your attention, his desire is for you to love him for himself and not just for the good things that he does in your life. I think that's a very important a motif, that he knows well that no one comes to him out of pure motive, but his desire is for us to begin to learn the wisdom of moving away from just his benefits and gifts and to turn to him himself and see that the giver is what you want, not just the gifts. In fact, even if the gifts were gone, you still have him, and if you have him, you have everything. And I think that's a, a important. What, what do you have there? Well, no, you discussed this in these two reflections. Oh, in those two reflections, yeah. About yeah. and. Yeah. Yeah, God and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, those are just some thoughts about this matter of need, and I think it's extremely important. You've got to come into contact with the fact every day, this morning, and every day, that you are a person in profound need, and ultimately you must cling to him. Our natural disposition would be to, auto to be autonomous and suppose that we can manage our affairs for ourselves. The wisdom would tell us instead that uh, we are men who need to cling to his character and hope in him and make him the anchor of our soul. And that is not to be a wimp, it's to be a person who's wise. It's a person to, to recognize his reality. And you begin to realize that ultimate reality is not you. And when you begin to realize that, the ultimate reality is a person. But the, but the wonder is that the ultimate reality is a person, a loving person. A person who has your best interests at heart. A person who pursues you. A person who desires and longs for better than you choose for yourself. We would choose lesser goods than God would choose for us. 
And that's, I think, a very important uh, thought. Um, I, okay. I, I think that uh, adversity also forces a choice, and I think that this is something I, I'd like to add as well. Not only does it make us aware of our need, but it also forces us to make a choice. It's this. Are we going to let others or our circumstances determine our future, or are we going to be transformed into the image of Christ through those difficult circumstances? In other words, are we going to allow, uh, are we going to choose the way of taking what happens and using it as material to draw us closer to him and to choose the way uh, of growth and redemption? Or will we uh, try to just allow ourselves to uh, reject circumstances, reject things, and refuse to get the lessons he has in mind for us? In the middle of the Second World War, uh, some, there's a story about some men who were on the front lines who scrounged up an old beaten up phonograph and uh, uh, a record of Enrico Caruso, who at that time was the best known operatic uh, uh, tenor. And that evening, as they sat around the tent listening to a scratchy, worn record, there were two distinct groups of listeners. One group only heard the scratches on the record and just the noise. But the other group listened more deeply. And behind the scratches, what did they hear? They heard the master's voice. And the scratches represent, as you can see, the... Uh, the choice that we make, we can listen to the scratches and not go break through and hear the voice behind it. In this world, you're not going to see him face to face. In this world, it's only going to be through a glass darkly or, as it were, through a bad phone, a, 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 a scratchy phonograph record. You know, just something. Now that's uh, that's an illustration. That won't mean anything in ten years from now. It's meaning less and less to people. What's a phonograph record? <laughs> that's that's the problem. But most of us are old enough to have at least some knowledge of what that was about. Um, and so it's a perspective then that we want to do. Ask for the grace for God to give you the wisdom of saying, I want to look not at the circumstances, but I want to look at you because you are the God who's behind them. And you never allow something to come to me unless it's filtered through the, uh, through the lens of your grace and your love and your purpose for me.